Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where we're pleased to welcome to the program this evening Mr. Gus Hall. And Mr. Hall is the uh, Secretary General of uh, General Secretary yeah. of the Communist Party of the USA. USA. <laughs> Mr. Hall, welcome very, very much. Very to nice to be here. I wonder if you might share at this time, if you could, and uh, if you bear with me and perhaps some of the general cable television audience, you have a basic view of the economic evolution of human society and so forth to see the differentiation within a a Marxian dialectic reading of the unfolding of human events between a socialist and a capitalist order. I wonder if maybe you could, just in your view, put a, a, a thumbnail summation of the differences you see between the various political, economic, organizing assumptions by which society is trying to organize itself now, the socialist mm -hmm. and the capitalist, perhaps. And maybe a broad yeah. general. Let me first say that we uh, have an uh, outlook on history generally and we believe that history moves in a progressive direction and that it's kind of an inevitable process, you know, from slavery to feudalism, from feudalism to capitalism. And we now believe that the next step is socialism. And uh, I often say that it's, uh, it's not only a good replacement for capitalism, but it's inevitable. And that's the direction the world is going and that's the direction that the United States uh, is going. And of course, the fundamental difference between a capitalist society and socialist society is that under capitalism, the industries and the banks are owned privately, and the motive of production is uh, is uh, profits for the individuals who, you know, handful of individuals that control them. And fundamentally, socialism is a society where the industries and the banks are made social prop uh, property, and they're nationalized and that the motive is uh, for the good of all instead of for the good of a few uh, individuals who own the industry. And then on that basis, the superstructure, you know, uh, is built and uh, so that it reflects that kind of an uh, economic uh, a situation. And, and that's what's um, happening in the one-third of the world, which are building socialist societies. And each one of them, they each do it in their own way, based on their own history and traditions and so on. The Russians build it according to their tradition, the Chinese and the Cubans each. And I've often said that socialism in the United States will be quite different than any place in the world for many reasons, including the fact that our history is different and, uh, and, and our traditions are uh, different. But even more important is that we will start building socialism on an industrial base that already exists and therefore we will not have what I, you know, have labeled the kind of a forced march in the building of the new society in, in the capital uh, accumulation and so on, which all of the other socialist countries have had to go through. And which was a process the whole human experience. Yes. Each society had to go through to build up their yes. capital base. Yes, yes so of on. course. But we'll have it and we'll build on top of what we have. Mm -hmm. We'll build on top of what we have. And yeah. it would seem to me that it would be the institution of private property or that the means of production are held in private hands that seems to be a basic point of distinction between, let's say, a Marxian analysis, which would see the collective ownership or yeah, the collective yeah. relationship to it. You think that's a basic, the institution of private property is a central core concept that yeah. is intrinsic to your thinking? Yeah, that's basically it, that the um, industries are socialized and made social property and, uh, and taken away from private hands. The only thing that uh, I think it's important to always say is that it will not happen to private property in general. Under socialism, homes and automobiles and, uh, you know, furniture and uh, things like that will remain uh, private property. And, and I, I must say it's interesting because most of the socialist revolutions have made a mistake on this question, mm -hmm. and that is that under the euphoria of the revolution, they've socialized uh, even, even small business and... Uh, and uh, shoe shine, uh, you know, uh, parlors and mm -hmm. barber shops and so on. And m most of them, all of them, have had to retreat from that and reestablish private property, you know, on the scale of, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether it's uh, tourist or, or, you know, items that are, you know, family, you know, items and so on. So they've all retreated from that total you know, elimination of private property, and including in the, even on the land, in the farms, they've had to retreat. And now farmers, while they are part of a collective uh, farm, 
that they have their own plot, you know, ground and uh, and they have a cow or two and pigs and so on. In other words, they've retreated somewhat from that total, total socialization of um, of everything. And they did, like, if I may, and I'm not a student of Russian or Soviet history, but they had uh, they introduced net new economic policy. The Chinese seem to be introducing policies which seem to be favoring the private aggrandizement, if that's the right word, or private incentive in a traditional way in order to gain what is seen as productivity gains by people who clearly see that what they're doing they're going to benefit from. So it's going back to a, yeah. a view of uh, individual initiative based on the idea that they're going to profit directly themselves for what they do. If it's a selfish view of man's nature or what? But yeah, no, that's a very interesting uh, question because it goes into the question of human nature. Yes, sir. And, um, and human nature changes uh, slowly. But it's society that determines and, uh, and, and molds human nature. And capitalism and, and uh, feudalism and slavery have molded a certain human nature that, you know, for a shortcut, I would say, kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog attitude towards uh, everything and, and selfishness and so on. Under socialism, that begins to change, and, and I think it's uh, changing and, and so on. But uh, also, again, here, some of the socialist countries um, eliminated all what's called m material incentives and, uh, you know, piecework or, or bonuses and, um, and so on. For instance, Cuba went through a certain period where they uh, had a certain uh, policy of equality of wages for everybody and so on. Well, it's, it became clear very quickly that human nature has not yet changed to that extent, mm. th that it still needs material incentives, and, and while it's changing, but it hasn't changed yet, to a position where I always say that the same human being that now under capitalism will say that I'm going to work hard because I'm going to benefit, that under advanced socialism and communism, that same human being will say I'm going to work hard because I will benefit, but everybody else is going to benefit. Uh -huh. In other words, that's how human nature is going to change. But that is a slower process than the economic change. And therefore, the socialist countries have had to and continue to deal, you know, with material incentives in one way or another. Mm -hmm. In order to try and build a milieu where these other kind of incentives could become characteristic yeah. of the... Yeah, I've, uh, nobody else has said it, but mm -hmm. I've always kind of said that it's a kind of a twilight zone mm -hmm. for socialism. And that is that the new socialist human being or communist human being in the sense of human nature has not arrived yet and, and however it's in the process but the, and Lenin used to talk about the fact that you know that socialism will inherit including a human nature that's not yet ready for socialism mm -hmm. but it changes but it's a slower process. Do you think it might be it's been defined economics the science of economics is defined by some as the science of the allocation of scarce resources do you think it would ever be in the evolution, technological or otherwise evolution of our knowledge base, that we'd arrive at a condition collectively in terms of the whole human society where sufficiency or even an opening on surplus or abundance would be a reality that yes. we would have to, at a certain or want to, have the opportunity to structure our institutions in terms of? Or, and I wonder. Yes. No, as a matter of fact, um, it's also a very interesting uh, question, and it's related to the question of human nature. See, up until this point in um, human history, every society has been a, a product of the distribution of scarcity. In other words, there has to be one way or another to divide what uh, is, there is not enough of. And that only when we have communism, which is still far away, there is no communism any place in the world today, mm -hmm. socialism and so on. But once we reach the point of communism, and there will be then enough of everything for everybody, then for the first time in human history, the problem will be the distribution of abundance. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. of course, when you think about that, you can imagine, you know, what a totally... Millennial. Yeah, Millennial. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you talk, uh, you know, uh, it'll be totally a different kind of society. You know, you'll have to do away with the question of coercion of any kind, and, uh, and therefore the police department and the military and, and a whole, you can't even imagine. But there's no question in my mind that we will reach that point. And, and especially the sooner the world goes, goes towards a socialism, the sooner technologically and scientifically we will be able to reach that point of production where there's enough of everything for everybody. It will be totally a different kind of society. 
You can imagine the amount of time that you can then spend on recreation, on yeah. studying, on culture. Uh -huh. They will emerge as a much more important uh, part of the human life than at the present time when they're squeezed for time in making a living. Just to earn a living. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in the yeah. face of earning a living. Yeah. Much yeah. less what effect that kind of a milieu would have on the relationship between the nations. We live at a time where peace or some alternative to a nuclear gadaramadung is absolutely imperative. So it would re affect the relations between the nations? Do you think oh. that there were a realization in, a this in, the, in the halls of the decision makers of our world institutions? Oh, absolutely. It isn't generally uh, raised or thought of as being perhaps a possibility that's emerging in, emerging in the midst of the political, dialectical battles going on in terms of the institutions we've inherited from the history that our technological success is bringing a condition that isn't generally understood sufficiently by the leaders of our inst world institutions, do you mm. think, political and otherwise? Yeah, well, of course, it'll do away, and socialism already will do away with the fund fundamental reasons why we have wars, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's true that, for instance, in the past, religions have become involved and so on, but fundamentally, all wars have an economic uh, base, economic competition, and, uh, and that uh, goes on and on, and... Uh, and when you have big corporations whose only purpose in life is to make private profits, they will do it domestically, but they will do it on a world scale. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what brings on policies of aggression and war and, and uh, so on. Under communism, when you have abundance, that will totally disappear. What? The animosity between nations will disappear, and that's why you can do away with the military completely, mm. and and it'll be a well, it'll be a great, a great thing. But the, the the period of abundance, we're in a what in a, in a in a period of transition in a sense from a well three million year sweep of human history, which might have been characterized as having been a condition of scarcity, yeah. to a time of major transformation. So, the, but the period of abundance in terms of our political structure is in the future, in a certain sense. It's a question yeah. of how we might be able to get there without, in a certain sense, destroying the species, which we the first time have the capability of doing. Yeah. It's a very crucial yeah. time, uh, don't you feel? Or oh, time in oh, the human condition? Oh. There's no question that uh, humanity has never faced the problem that uh, we face today. And I've often said, you know, speaking for our party, that everybody has to adjust in one way or another to this new uh, problem. And that's the uh, the threat of nuclear annihilation and the uh, nuclear winter and uh, and so on, and that it threatens everybody, and that uh, literally with a touch of the button, you know, that the whole thing can be wiped out and uh, and we'll have a bare bare uh, a globe here, and therefore there's no question that that is a most serious problem. And one way or another, for instance, we I've always said this, one way or another we must. You know, two countries, the Soviet Union and the United States, simply must find a way to coming to some agreement and putting an end to this uh, this idiotic and dangerous arms nuclear arms race. And and there's no question, there's a point of no return in this uh, this thing. You know that it'll reach a point where you can't turn back. And and therefore, we before we reach that point, we must find some way of putting an end to this terrible well. Terrible is even <laughs> another, mm -hmm. it doesn't even describe what the real problem is. And therefore, our party, for instance, we spend a lot of time on, uh, on this uh, question, which is a struggle for peace. And, and fundamentally, right now, for instance, it's really a struggle against the policies that the Reagan administration pursues. And that's why our slogan has been for some time, for instance, that there has to be a 180-degree turnaround in our foreign policy and that we're moving in the wrong uh, direction. And for instance, while there's negotiations going on in Geneva right now, and I am one of the more hopeful ones, I think, and even somewhat positive, that something will break there and we can uh, you know, start the, the process. But it's difficult to be optimistic when the MX missile was passed by two votes in, um, in uh, Congress and, and the Star Wars, which is uh, really a, uh, it's totally misunderstood, and, and Reagan purposely calls it the peace initiative, uh, strategic peace initiative. It has, of defense, it has nothing to do with defense. The Star Wars is a system really to shield all the other nuclear weapons in order so that they become an offensive we weapons, and it shields, you know, the counterattack. And, and it, from that viewpoint, it's the most dangerous of all developments is this whole concept 
of, of militarization of space. It takes, it takes the world into an area that it's very difficult to control, first of all, mm -hmm. because how are you going to check, you know, what's up there once, uh, once the two nations start moving in that direction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I suppose the people that are in favor of that or project that see it as a defensive move to try and run the arms race yeah. backwards in a certain sense. I mean, they, you know, they probably see it that way. Way or well, there are some, but uh, for instance, I just read the um, statement of the uh, the uh, head of the our Air Force, uh, the General Gabriel of the Air Force. Well, what he said about the Star Wars was that uh, that it is a uh, it is a very effective offensive weapon, mm. and and it has nothing to really do. It defends our missiles so they can act. That's all the defensive about it is the missiles so that they can launch a first strike. And, and, and not expect a retaliatory uh, response. Yeah, in any event, yeah. the, the, the military response between the peoples who represent, let's say, the Soviet Union and the United States continues, unfortunately, yeah, to be a yeah. uh, thing to which we repair in order to try and work out yeah. differences of opinion. I wonder if we come back to that question of what basically is motivating, as it were, in a sense, this notion, we said, the institution of private property in a public, uh, in, a, yeah. in, a, in a capitalist or an Amer uh, the American society traditionally as it's developed, in a certain sense, represents the center of what would be the capitalist organization in a, in a certain sense. Yeah. yeah. The institution of private property or the means of production, uh, the, the capital means of production, are very, very narrowly held in the American society. Oh, it's, 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 a, it's a narrow ownership base in terms of who owns the means of production in this private property economy? Yeah. yeah. Basically, it's, uh, I think, basically, it's less than 5% of the uh, population that, that are in a controlling a position. See, about capitalism and private property, it played a uh, positive role in history. It certainly was much more uh, progressive and advancement over slavery and uh, feudalism, and it played a positive role in building industry and, uh, and so on. But uh, now it's outdated. It cannot handle the new level of technology, and that's why movements, I think, towards a new society and socialism uh, takes uh, place. And let me just say all the questions that the Reagan administration, for instance, is trying to handle I think it's proof, you know, that we need a new kind of a society to handle some of these uh, uh, problems. And therefore, private property becomes an obstacle. Now, it was a positive thing, but it becomes an obstacle for, for human advancement, and that's why socialism becomes on the order of the day. Mm. But, of course, then Mr. Reagan and the, 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 the and if some of the Gallup polls and so forth are to understand, a good deal of the American society, at least as they're able to form these decisions, 62%, gave general approval to his handling of the American foreign and domestic policy yeah. and so forth, seems to have been, at least in the recent experience, moving toward trying to discover what they feel are roots of private property ownership basis yeah. for the American economy and not moving in that direction towards socialism. The fairness issue didn't do very well in the last election and so forth. Yeah. seems to be developing toward entrepreneurial new developments in, in, a, in a maintaining the institution of private property. Yeah. Uh, See, I, yeah, yeah. I, uh, as you know, I was a candidate, uh, you know, in the last uh, last four elections yes, for president, and uh, so I was very close to, uh, you know, the mass sentiments and so on. Reagan's re-election is one of the uh, really unusual, you know, uh, fantastic in some ways, uh, a, uh, a things, and that is that the people. I think most of the people that voted for him really didn't think about the economy, really didn't think about the problems. They saw this man on television, he's good looking, he's a the so called communicator mm -hmm. and and so on. And for some reason in the last years, I didn't think it started with Reagan, I think it already started a earlier, that the people see the presidency not as a policy maker. They see the presidency more as a figurehead, you know, spokesman and Reagan of course is very good at uh, a, that and that the people kind of voted for Reagan as their good spokesman. And at the same time, wherever they had an opportunity, they voted against Reaganism and Reagan's policies, including elected congressmen and senators who were against a, um, a Reagan. And wherever there were policy questions on the, on the ballot, they voted against Reagan's policy, just one place after another, and the same people voted for Reagan because they, I think they see him more as a figurehead uh, person and a good communicator, and they think the country needs that. And I think they still see him. 
and they don't relate him to the problems. Congress is blamed, and uh, many other things are blamed, but not Reagan. And that's where the phrase came, you know, the Teflon effect, that mm -hmm. nothing affected him. And I think there's some of that uh, still... Although I don't think uh, I don't think he's going to go on very long. I think he's going to start losing the support, especially with things like um, the Social Security vote, where he so directly and fundamentally said nothing will ever happen to the uh, the uh, senior citizens on Social Security. And now, of course, he went ahead and uh, and agreed on a minimum two percent cut, you know, and w in relation to inflation and so on. So I think more and more what the people are going to see is that he has deceived them and that he, what he said in the elections really isn't coming true. <clears throat> For instance, if you take the question of peace, the people vote in the same polls for peace all the way through. And because Reagan said in the elections that he's going to negotiate seriously with the Soviet Union and that he's going to find a way to peace, there are just millions of people who voted for Reagan who now expect the Geneva negotiations to uh, bring about a peace treaty and, and so that he, in a sense, mobilized the expectations of the people for peace and, and he's not moving in that direction and that's going to create, again, disillusionment with him. So I don't think he's going to be able to maintain this facade very long. I think it's going to begin to crack. Yeah, I think it probably would have been uh, that uh, he, he is a conservatively inclined yeah, very man much, yeah. Uh, yeah. and has a conservatively inclined view of the e economy and so forth. I think it might be that if it were possible to go back before the intervention, the governmental intervention, the New Deal and Social Security and other these things, the intervention of what they would see as the free marketplace yeah, forces yeah. that should allocate resources, they generally try to like to see the free marketplace forces allocate resources in that yeah. traditional almost Adam Smith yeah, notion yeah, in some, yeah. some sense. Do you think an alternative would be as if the economy flounders? Of course, there would be great difficulties and so forth, and some of the backup systems of government intervention in the marketplace would have been undercut. But if the economy flourishes, if it does flourish, if there is, as he calls, a shining recovery, if the economy moves well, they've brought inflation under control, they've brought the interest rates down from where they were, they have a big deficit and stuff. But if there was success in terms of the American uh, economy, would it be a different situation in terms of the way the society would relate to him? Is the problems he'd run into inherent to the, 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 the system not being able to, you know, work effectively and so forth? No, there's no question that in some way he's also been very lucky as far as the economy is con uh, concerned. Even before this last election, the fact that there was some recovery in many parts of the, um, some industries, not all, well, for instance, steel industry, no recovery, uh, machine building, rubber, and so on, no uh, recovery. But uh, let me just say that I'm one of those who uh, I'm absolutely convinced that this economic recovery or upturn is uh, coming to an end and that we are in the first stages of another economic depression. And, depression? And, yes. And what I've been saying is actually that that what we then have is a three-layered crisis, the general crisis that, uh, of world capitalism. Then we have structural crisis, which I had a hand in actually originating the whole concept. And the structural crisis is, is what has killed the steel industry and the, it's killing the automobile industry and so on. And then we have the cyclical crisis, and I think now we're headed for a new cyclical crisis. So you'll have a three-layered crisis again, and when that happens, that's when Reagan is going to lose his support. And, and that's when the people are going to um, raise sharply the question of, uh, of a livelihood. Because even during this economic upsurge, it's one of those unusual things that we have 30 million living below the poverty level. We have 20 million uh, homeless and hungry. And, and by the way, that's increasing. And what's interesting is that during this very upturn, that the hungry have become hungrier. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are more hungry now than they were two years ago and, and three years ago. And, and once the cyclical crisis comes on top of everything else, then I think they're going to see the relationship between Reagan's policies and these economic uh, uh, developments. And there's no question that that will be a moment when, again, there will be an upsurge of radicalism and, and, uh, and anger and uh, mass movements and demonstration. In that sense, uh, it's one of those ironical things that 
Reagan has been a lifetime anti-communist, mm -hmm. as you know, and, and fanatically so, and, um, and so on. But that in these four years, and now the fifth year, he has done more than I've done, or anybody has done, to make people think about radical solutions, including make people think about our party. By and, forcing uh, what would be like a dialectic yeah, expression because, of the contradiction. Yeah, the contradiction that the people, when they get uh, in dire straits and um, hunger and poverty and, and, and the war danger added to it and so on, that people will look for a more radical solutions, and and one of the solution, uh, you know, solutions is that they will lose confidence that capitalism can do it anymore. In other words, they will see that capitalism as a society has lived its uh, and uh, and its uh, place in history and it's uh, dying, and therefore they look for solutions like uh, socialism, and there is that's one of the interesting things about um, the American people that while Reagan has moved to the right and there has grown a kind of a right wing, even a fascist fringe in the United States, but the people have not become, um, joined anything. There's no hysteria. There's no anti-communist hysteria now. People want to listen. They're very uh, sincere. I appear in, uh, you know, many uh, talk shows and uh, colleges and so on. That the fact is that even when people disagree and they don't, uh, you know, agree with socialism, they're very respectful and they're very serious and, and, and they ask questions, and, but questions that they are really interested. And the interesting is that now, olden days, they used to ask questions about socialism, the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. or China, and so on. Now the questions are more in the direction, they say, what will socialism do in the United States? Mm -hmm. What will socialism do for me? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and that they really want to go into the question of what socialism will do in the solution of the problems that they face at the present time. That's a very big change, I think, in the thought patterns of, uh, of millions of Americans. They seem, from you perspective, to be ready to give it a listen, where yes. in the past they might have been yes. more rhetorical. In the 50s, there was yeah. an anti-communist yeah. in this country. Oh. You suffered under... Oh, America. of course. Yeah. radically for the Oh, change. yeah. Come as you know... How do you for the change? Well, it's sometimes difficult to say, but as you know, I served an eight-year prison term in Leavenworth, Kansas, for thinking in the McCarthy period, and there was a hysteria, and a and lot of uh, innocent people suffered for it. Thousands lost their jobs, and I think most Americans don't really know what happened in that, uh, and somebody should really uh, write it up. When I came out of prison and began to appear, especially in colleges, we got the biggest crowds of anybody, and that still is uh, a, uh, true. For instance, I, I was advertised to speak uh, in uh, Eugene, Oregon, for so I just recall that. And, and it just a postcard came to me, see if I want to come and uh, speak there, and it was in the football field. 16,000 people, students and faculty came just to hear a communist uh, leader. But much of that, I think, was curiosity in the sense that this was the first live communist that they had uh, seen. And they listened, but it was different. Now that, you know, that is not there anymore. They've heard and listened to communists. But they come now really to find out more about socialism, more about Marxism, what is the science all about. And, and so it's that kind of a shift in attitude. I think the reason for it is that the problems are more serious and uh, difficult. The moment in history is uh, it's a very critical moment, uh, as we know. And I think people are looking for basic answers and solutions to things, and I think th that's why we get a better hearing now. Mm -hmm. They're looking for base at, at, a, at a time of crisis. I wonder if such an attitude is developing within the Soviet Union toward basic premises of, let's say, a capitalist-oriented society. Or is well, it China? China is taking a new yeah. orientation in terms of a traditional socialist view. It is moving toward individual yeah, see, yeah. So Ch forth. China. Is it, is it a condition in the world, perhaps? Yeah. People listening, whereas previously they'd been. Well, I think there's some of uh, some of that. China is a kind of a special uh, case. China was one of the uh, you know places where socialism could, took kind of an extreme. Mao's concepts were very extreme, including he thought that uh, you know that uh, you could skip stages and and skip almost from feudalism to communism or socialism, and that's impossible. You just must go step at a time, and you cannot skip stages. And therefore, they went what one could call left, but it's not really <coughs> kind of an anarchistic left a direction. The communes, for instance, that he set up 
which were really, uh, you know, well, they were communes. That's what they really were. Yeah. And, of course, China was not uh, ready for anything like that. And therefore, China has had to retreat, you know, and, and, and reorganize the socialist society. I think in that process, it's possible that they go a little too far the opposite direction on some um, uh, questions. I see nothing wrong, and the Soviet Union used it in its early days, of uh, joint ventures with corporations, you know, as long as they're under control of the, uh, the socialist government and, and so on. And China is using that, and I, I think they have to at this stage in order to try and catch up, because one of the problems of, uh, and the results of the Maoist policies was that China was literally left 20, 30 years behind times and that they have to now kind of make up. And in order to speed it, they, they have these joint ventures with corp corporations and the, who makes profits out of them and so on. But I, I think it's almost necessary for China at this stage to do that. And some of the other countries, Romania has some of Yugoslavia and, um, and so on. But I think it's a temporary, I think it, these are temporary measures and that the, they will move back you know, into full socialist construction. Back towards full socialist yeah, construction yeah. and away from the so it would be an aberration in a certain sense. Yeah, moving yeah, in that yeah, direction. yeah. Some people would, you would understand, people who are more aligned with a more conservative view of the human condition and so forth would say that some of those expressions might be expressions of what they see as being um, libertarian or, or freedom movements for individuals within a collective society and so forth. I suppose you've heard that over yeah, the years, the yeah, question of freedom yeah. and of course one of the yeah. basic bulwarks of thinking traditionally in the American tradition and so forth, and sometimes been equated, I guess, maybe with that idea of private property in yeah, some people's yeah. minds. But the question of freedom and the question of libertarian... Yeah. I wonder if you could just address yourself generally to that. Yeah, well, it's a big question uh, in both societies, and uh, although basically comes from a different source. But there's no question that uh, these countries that are building socialism, they are moving step by step in the direction of more democracy and, and more freedom. As a matter of fact, one of the things that uh, fascinates me when I visit the Soviet Union is the, that, and you can see it, the steps that they are taking to literally guarantee that, that the majority of the people will be in decision-making position, that they literally are in, in factories, for instance, that they make the basic decisions and they are drawing in more and more people into the decision-making process, and there's nothing phony about it. They really do give have power, and, and so that they move more and more in uh, that direction. See, socialism is a new society, and, and one of the problems that they've all faced, which I said in earlier, is the forced march kind of a business where you have to. And the Soviet Union, for instance, you have to put it in the proper historic context, that it was the first socialist country, surrounded by capitalist countries that not only have threatened to undo it, but tried to. They invaded, including the United States, and, uh, and so on. And the blockades, you know, that continued uh, up until, for instance, well, the United States didn't recognize the Soviet Union until Roosevelt came uh, mm. into um, a office. So they've had that problem of building up with their own bootstraps, kind of. And when you have that situation, you, in that same point, you build kind of a fortress mentality even, that you have to protect everything. And I think one of Stalin's uh, problems was in his later years that when it wasn't necessary anymore to have that kind of an outlook and when there were more socialist countries and, uh, and, uh, and so on, he didn't know how. And they had mm -hmm. difficulty in, in shifting from that kind of a position of total defense and security and therefore you can't afford the luxury of democratic process and so on. And that, that, that's really where Stalin uh, made his big mistakes in his latter years. And that's where the, some of the crimes took place because he continued the, you know, security on the basis of, uh, of force mm. and so on. But I think the Soviet Union drew lessons from that. And, uh, and when Khrushchev came in, I think they began the process. And I think they've made uh, changes in their governmental structure that will guarantee that that Stalin's kind of a thing will not be repeated there. It would hope. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so I mean, I, it's probably good for us on our side to try and yeah. remember in the United States where we do have a great number of us who are very committed to free institutions yeah. and there are a number of freedoms yeah. vouchsafed to us yeah. here that are important to keep in mind and so forth. 
that they 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 have suffered uh, oh. they have suffered in a way that uh, yeah. it's hard for any of the nations of the world to understand. They took the blood of the Second World yeah. War, and they've had a very difficult time building up their capital base again. So yeah. oh. I wonder if we have uh, some room on our side to understand that society perhaps more appropriately than I perhaps know. we do generally. Do you I know? think. Oh, I think there's a great need uh, for that. I, interesting experience I had with uh, with Cuba mm. and with Castro in these early uh, years. You know, after the Cuban Revolution, I forget how many years, but anyway, at a certain point, I raised with Castro through a letter that I, I think they should move faster towards having uh, parliamentary elections. And, and I even used the argument, I said that maybe the Cubans don't need the elections, but, but the people world. in the world yeah. that once support the right of Cubans to make their own decisions need those uh, elections. And I, for instance, used uh, even Lenin's experience that it wasn't within months after the Russian Revolution Lenin raised the question of elections and pushed it and, uh, and all that. But then years later I went to Cuba and, and once you're in Cuba the perspective is somewhat different that here is this little country, an island and, and against the big uh, country, mm. United States, that refuses to recognize it and threatens it and the Bay of Pigs thing and so on. And then you somehow or another, nobody had to tell me, I began to think maybe I was wrong, that Cuba didn't have the luxury in those years, and what Cuba has done since, I think, is proof of that, that they've started, I think, three, four years ago, the process of building an electoral system. They started from the bottom, city councils and then regions, and they're moving in the direction of an electoral system, and now they feel that they, uh, it's, not a, it's not a luxury but that they can do it now. They can have these kind of things allowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so, so this would be an evolving in that, in that direction as well, toward a, a I wonder if we're going to arrive at some condition if we are wise enough collectively as human yeah. society to avoid uh, the destructive holocaust, which yeah, is the yeah. height of lunacy and so forth, if we'll arrive at a world that would be in a certain sense, uh, I don't know, James Joyce said history is a nightmare from which we're awakened. We do come out of a historical condition what kind of a relationship will we have with historical institutions? I mean, would it be, would there be a, a, a meeting of the ground between two parts of a, a black and white situation? It'd be a sort of gray area, so there might be a blending of some of the concepts that have been expressive of one end of that dialectic and some of the others. It wouldn't be all one, or do you think it'll be winner take all in terms of this kind of a movement, you know, into the future collectively as a yeah. world society? Well, I think when it comes to uh, systems of society, uh, fundamentally, I think uh, there will not be a blending. I think it will move towards socialism. But there is many things that capitalism has developed and, and that can be adopted. And for instance, I often say, and I firmly believe, that in socialism in the United States, there's many things that we will adopt from the present day, including such things, um, take the Bill of Rights, well, the history of that, as we know, is that the reason the Bill of Rights was written was that the American people refused to accept the Constitution as it was written and demanded a Bill of Rights, and when they got the Bill of Rights, then they voted for the Constitution. I'm convinced that when we write a socialist Constitution, people are not going to accept that without a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights will have many of the same things as in the present day. Do you envision a constitutional convention or writing oh, a constitution yeah. oh, in terms of the way in which it's yeah. And there's, the changes aren't going to be in structure-wise that big. For instance, I, one of the things that I think we'd have to change is uh, how we elect congressmen and senators or even state representatives and legislators. And that is that the present system literally provides that the rich get elected. You know, there are Congress is mainly a millionaires and uh, attorneys and, uh, and speculators and, uh, and so on. We would, it seems to me, have to make some changes in the structure to, in a sense, I actually guarantee that the majority of the people in Congress, for instance, will be composed of people who work for a living. One way or another who work for a living, and, and the majority, it doesn't, all have, doesn't have to be, but the majority should be of people who work for a living, because that's the majority of the population, and therefore they should, re they should represent the majority well, of the population. Well, as you said before, 5% of the population yeah owns yeah. the technology yeah. in a certain yeah. sense. It's one part of a productive. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else, in a certain sense, 95% of, of the population would be working or using yeah. their labor yeah. or their, their, yeah. their contribution in order to gain an income. So that would be 
most of the people. Right? Yeah, it yeah, yeah. Of it'll, of it'll be the most democratic situation and system that this world has ever seen, in my opinion. Fundamentally, that, that, that will be socialism in the United States. You think it would require that those who are in the position, it would, would it require that those who are currently in the position of the five percenters, if you call them, or the people that are in the position of leadership, would in a certain sense either have to be... Uh, not allowed, eliminated, <laughs> or how would you deal with that? Would they be people that would be allowed? And the institutional assumptions yeah. they represent, would yeah. they be inclusive in terms of the social organization of the society, or would they just simply have to be somehow? Yeah, it's interesting because it's related. Eliminated. To, it's, or yeah, it's related to a story when I'm asked about uh, whether I see the transition to social and peaceful or or violent. And I said, it all depends. If, if the electoral system is uh, broad enough that people can elect socialist-minded, communist, socialist, and so on, that's fine. That's what we advocate, and that's what we would continue to support, and so on. But, but we can't guarantee, because we're not the only ones involved. And I often say that when the auto workers in Detroit, you know, will elect the committee and send it to that hill, the big General Motors headquarters, and we'll tell the executives there, say, look, gentlemen, you know, socialism is here now, and we are now going to take these industries and we're going to run them now, and therefore we have come here for the transition. So I often say that if the General Motors executives will say, good, we agree with you, we've made a mess of things, we'll turn it over, and here are the computers, and here's the desks, and so on. If that happens, it'll be a peaceful uh, a, a, a revolution. And that the committee most likely would say, look, you know, there's jobs open uh, down the hill, and get a pair of overalls and uh, and go down and work for a living. And uh, I I think many of them will. Probably more like a white coat in this computer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the right. Yeah. I, I think many of them will. And uh, and, you, and you feel that the pe those people would be able to, in a certain sense, do better to use the term management decision making than current management decision making for our privately held institutional structures who have a. Yeah. Uh, you understand? I mean, yeah, they do yeah. better than they do in competitive marketplaces. Yeah, I think so. so. Like yeah, I think, yeah, I think uh, so. In the first place, uh, you know, there's a lot of what's called um, the ASOPs, uh, ESOP, yeah. ESOPs uh, mm -hmm. that are coming into being. As a matter of fact, interesting is that I wrote an article on this, um, criticizing this concept, and now the last issue of Business Week, which is a big business magazine also is critical of uh, of the whole uh, idea. Well, with Gus Hall criticizing and the Wall Street Journal yeah. criticizing, it must have something pretty good. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just jesting. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. But yeah. we come to that position from two different directions. Yes. Business Week, of course, is a little afraid that this may set a precedent and workers will take over industries and they, they see that danger. But they say that it's, um, it's a ripoff of workers, and that I say that also. In, in what happens on most of those cases that they have to borrow large sums of money, and so therefore, instead of working for the corporation, they're going to work for the banks because the, the, the loans are tremendous. Well, until the, the loans pay themselves off, and like good business mm. logic, is it'll capital will pay for itself in four to five years, mm. and then throw up productivity after mm. that, and it can begin to begin. Yeah. To ha Do you think it would be possible for us to begin to expand ownership of privately held? Uh, ownership of the productive economy as an instrument of income distribution. So instead of 5% of our population gaining income by having ownership of the means of production through a private property holding of it, 90% of us could gain income that way and free us up to do things other than work for a living, particularly as we enter into an mm. increasingly cybernated and uh, technologically oriented overall productive system. Yeah, I doubt whether it'll uh, you know go that uh, far, but there's no question that uh, that the new technology is going to create a situation where the the hours of work will be cut, and it'll be especially if it's in if it's in the hands of people, it's in the hands of private corporations. There won't be much, you know, much different. You take the new General Motors plant, the Saturn plant that they're now starting to build. Well, it is a beginning of a new stage of uh, technological revolution in, in this country, mm -hmm. and it will almost have no workers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's going to create uh, some unemployment. As long as that takes place under capitalism, it creates unemployment. Under different conditions, under socialism, the hours will be cut. And I often say, uh, you know, what's wrong with working four hours a day? Uh, you know, I, I don't think human beings were ever put on here to work eight hours or six hours. And if machinery takes over, fine. But you have to cut the hours of work 
in order to uh, create the jobs, otherwise there's unemployment. And that will force people to think in terms of socialism. This technology itself forces people to think in terms of socialism. In terms of socialism, of collectively yeah, distributing and the productive owning, yeah. capability yeah, of this yeah. intermix between technology yeah. and human labor. Yeah. You don't see yeah. the possibility of having income distributed. If, you, if you're one of the 5% now, yeah. and let's say you have a million dollar portfolio, and you're going to gain, what would you get? $100,000 a year in income by the fact that you own that. You don't do anything for that. That yeah. general principle, yeah. you don't need to yeah. in a conservative, well managed and moving ahead society and so forth. You don't think that general principle of distribution could be expanded to greater numbers of people so that income would be distributed by ownership of the technology that is actually producing well? The rather than through yeah. taxation mm. and so forth. Uh, the five percent will not permit it. That's the fundamental problem. Under capitalism the five percent simply will not permit it. And that's why there has to be a change in the social system. You don't think that will permit the, exp uh, the expanding ownership of that, even no. if it's done in a condition where that's expanding the institution of private property yeah. in well, the general society? Yeah, yeah. No, no. Big business They're is big business. No, no. 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 As a matter of fact, uh, intelligent. Yeah, they're intelligent. Uh, they're smart in business-wise, but they're not intelligent when it comes to these kind of questions. And no matter how much they have, they want more. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. There is no limit to what they what they want. And more, even right now, look at the problems the country faces with the, you know, 30 million below the poverty level, the mm -hmm. homeless all over the place. Mm -hmm. And corporate profits are the highest in history. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they will not give up one penny unless they're forced to. And, of course, unions sometimes force something out of them. But they but the unions even have had to be taking a back seat more and more in the negotiating process and have been even some unions have bargained down away yeah, from the yeah. position they'd had because... To find there what, uh, in order for there to be something distributed, there's got to be production, there's got to be there to be distributed. Yeah? Well, the unions actually face a real serious crisis in the United States, and uh, it's for many reasons, but fundamentally it's uh, for the reasons that there's been, there's been a corporate offensive, anti-union offensive, and when Reagan came in, he added to it. First thing, he you know, broke the, uh, the air controllers uh, union, not just the strike, but the air controllers union. And therefore, there's been great pressure on the unions, and they've had to uh, make concessions, giveaways, and, um, and so on. And it will still go on, I think, for um, a little while. But then there's going to be a turnaround, and the unions will have to take up the struggle and, and fight against to get more of these tremendous profits that the corporations are making in order to get some of that into the wages and, and conditions. So, but at the moment, the trade unions are facing a very serious problem. They have. It's a, a great it's a deal crisis. of pressure yeah, on them great uh, crisis. In, 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 in many ways. That might be making them more appropriately able to listen to what would have been seen from their perspective or from yours as, as going to the root radical solutions to the overall yeah, yeah. contradictions of well, the systems you would see. For it. instance, uh, I think it's uh, 15 years ago I raised the question, that the industry should be nationalized. They should be taken over by the government, not bought. They should be taken over, and they should set up what I call uh, industrial authorities, which would include the representatives of the people, the unions, the city councils, the churches, and that they, they should operate these um, uh, industries. Well, when I first raised this, it was such a far-out idea. I mean, union leaders wouldn't even touch it. Now what I call my union, the Steel Union, because I'm one of the founding members of the United Steel Workers of America, their next convention officially is taking up the question of nationalization of the steel industry. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to adopt it, but the fact that they're officially taking it up to discuss, and they call it a viable alternative, you know, one of the viable alternatives for steel, well, that's the kind of changes that have taken place in the thought patterns that, that the union now understands that we have to move in this direction and, and uh, there's no other solution for some of these industries except to take it over. And we have a kind of a rounded out program. Number one, that these industries should be taken over. Number two, our cities are crumbling and all you have to say is New York and subways and, uh, and so on. The cities are crumbling, therefore there has to be what I call a massive federal reconstruction program and it has to be by the federal government, in order to rebuild our cities and housing and, and mass transit and, and everything else. That would provide the market for the steel industry, 
for, for years and years to come. And if the steel industry is nationalized, you take the corporate profits that now go into the hands of a few, and you use those profits to modernize the U.S. steel industry. U.S. steel industry used to be the most modern for 100 years. Now it's one of the most backward industries technology in the world. Mm -hmm. It's something like 30 years behind most of the uh, big uh, industrial uh, countries. And the reason for it is that these corporations and the, you know, the big stockholders have milked out all the profits and they've put nothing back into the industry in the sense of new, industry, new machinery and new technology. And so it's, it can't compete now. And therefore, the nationalization process would, you know, resolve that question, and there would be money for new technology so that the steel industry could compete in the world market. What relationship, in your view, if you see that, what relationship would that movement or that political organization of the society have toward, let's say, those who have an ownership stake in the existing technologies? Well, on that, I've, you know, often said that the small stockholders, you know, people who have few stocks, that somehow or another there has to be a provision to pay pay those stockholders. But the big ones which really control, and it's just few families really, I mean the real big um, families, that that should be confiscated. That That's part of the nationalization. Yeah, they have enough to live on, you know, more than enough to live on, so let them live on their fat that they've accumulated. Small stockholders, and there are millions of them, but they really have no controlling interest, but they have stocks. So we have to make provisions to take care of them, it seems to me, some way. Uh -huh. And you would eliminate then the trading in publicly held company or, or, or the stock? It would be a different, it would be a national, a totally national, nationalized national, economy. National. So it would all be within, in a certain sense, a, a governmental arrangement in terms yeah. of the allocation and distribution of resources. Yeah, I, think, I, I don't think there's any other way of doing it except that the federal government has to move in. It's interesting. I, you know, come from Youngstown, Ohio, and uh, actually the first steel plant that uh, was shut down in this crisis was a steel plant I used to work in. And so I went to Youngstown a number of times uh, to speak, and I met with all kinds of people there. And in the early years, there were committees set up by the churches, especially they played a big role in this, committees set up to buy this steel mill. And so I, on television, radio there, and in some meetings, I often said that uh, I, in a way, feel bad that I have to disagree with you. It's not going to work. And, and therefore, the only thing that's going to work is that we should agitate for the federal government to take over these mills and turn them over to the community for the operation. In other words, make them national property. And now when I go back there, almost everybody agrees that I was right in the first place and that all of the ideas and gimmicks they tried to work, it just didn't work, and that they have come to the conclusion that nationalization is a, is a necessary thing, and that's why it's going to be on the agenda of the Steel Union Convention. Would we then eliminate the marketplace as a way of allocating oh, no. resources? Or what is the relationship no, no. with the marketplace? Or how would that no, under these con conditions, the marketplace would continue, and, uh, because it's not really socialism. Nationalization isn't socialism. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the marketplace would continue, and they would, they'd have to deal with the market as it is. Well, it would be a great deal of, uh, you'd have an overall planning ability to see what is being done without the problems of, that are these, these um, private sector yeah. entrepreneurial development and so yeah. forth would be providing. Some people, of course, would be very upset with that general notion. I think it would become very yeah. bureaucratically and over, bureaucratic and inefficient and overwheeled and not able to get anything done because committees never get anything done. And that kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. you heard that. It's yeah, and that, would, no question, that would be a problem. It, mm. It's a problem everywhere. And even the socialist countries, there's a constant struggle against bureaucracy and bureaucratic habits and, um, and, uh, and so on. No, I, I, but I think we're forced to think in those terms. Even with all the problems of nationalization, we are forced to think in, uh, in those kind of a, uh, a terms. Mm. Do, you think, do you think that, uh, we, we touched on it briefly before, but the, the, the question of the input ratio to production, the, the, the question of technology on one side and labor or human input on the other, do you think that it's increasingly become a matter of technology that is responsible for actual production? Increasingly through yeah. time as a relationship to labor's contribution or human input contribution to it, whether it be, you know, physical labor or intellectual labor. Or is it technology yeah. increasingly? Are we entering an age of technology dominating the overall productive process? Absolutely. Uh -huh. No, there's no question about that. And, and, and under capitalism, technology creates real problems. 
because they don't adjust to, uh, to the new technology. Like this new plant, General Motors sees this new plant only from one viewpoint, and that's more profits. They're not going to be concerned about the fact that it's going to lay off you know, millions of workers, and uh, that's not their business. Their business is corporate profits, and, 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 and that's how they're going to see this new technology. That, that's the, and secondly, of course, it does even speed up the manual you know, human uh, uh, labor. T that's one of the reasons uh, technology, you know, comes into being, that it speeds up the, uh, the production uh, process uh, tremendously. You know, for instance, in Ohio, a few years ago, there's a uh, automobile plant there in Lordstown, the plant. Well, this was an also an experimental uh, kind of a plant in the sense that they only hired very young people and they said that they set up this plant, and I think they had 20,000 workers there at one time, just three, four, five years ago. And they only hired young people because they said they want to use that as a pilot project to see how far you can speed up the human person. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they did. I mean, they just piled it up, and finally there were strikes, and, and they had to back down on it. But they said that was the whole idea, to use technology to speed up the human process. Uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But it, it would seem to be that in a certain sense the technology is increasingly responsible for production down to robotized plants that are yeah. turning out goods and ser uh, services and go services and goods and so forth and that so that the, the claim that the individual would have for income for life's purposes could not as effectively be based on their labor input to a process that's overly technological. It would be based on democratically arrived at notions of distribution according to need through governmental processes and so forth. Part of that uh, definitely will have to uh, take place. In other words, the demand of the unions are, and I think correctly so, that the workers must get the profits from the new technology. In other words, whatever way you know it's done, that they must get the benefits of this new technology. But if there are no workers, if you have a well, totally workerless plant. That's it's gonna, How it's do gonna, we relate to that? It's going to under capitalism create some real problems. And, and of course, based on that, for instance, we have proposed uh, a new unemployment law. Mm -hmm. And you might be interested that the present unemployment uh, benefit law w was introduced by our party. Okay. We, we initiated it and we literally wrote the first bill, I think. And, and so it's a, if you're unemployed for a certain number of weeks, you get unemployment benefit. But now with this new technology, you have what's called a permanently unemployed, and it's increasing numbers. And therefore, the new law that we are proposing is that unemployment benefits must start from the last paycheck, and it must go on however long till the first paycheck. In other words, that there's no cutoff date of the unemployment benefits and so on. This is part of the, one of the ways to, dis to distribute the profits of the new technology. Through the government yeah, taxation yeah, when yeah, distributed yeah, according yeah, to a yeah. socially seen need. Well, yeah. it's a basic view of the, uh, of the contemporary human condition. It's one that I think it does us all well to understand better because it's one that a great deal of the world yeah, relates yeah. to with increasing importance. It's one we ought to better understand in whatever way we can because we all share the common interest of trying mm. to find our way through some of these conundrums yeah. to a better yeah. world order in a particularly uh, crucial time in that broader development. And if there's been a leading edge in terms of the progressive, uh, communist, leftist scene forces yeah. here in the United States, it's been Communist Party USA and yeah. yourself. And yeah. I really thank you for all no, your contributions over No, no, thank you very years. much. And I certainly thank you for participating here in, the particular, no, in this okay. particular series. It has been your pleasure, of course, to have the perceptions of Gus Hall, the Secretary General, General, Sec General, Secretary. General Secretary, Communist Party USA. And happy to have been able to bring you those perceptions. Invite you to tune in again next week. I'm afraid that's it for this particular segment. We'll see you next week. And once again, Mr. Hall, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for, for inviting me. Pleasure.